All right. Now, uh, we we're, we're try to stay on the time, but we're not inflexible. Uh, we try to be a little more inflexible at the beginning of the week because we don't want to start a bad habit. You know? And this is the end of the week. My thought is if these guys all go over today, what are you going to do? Leave? <coughs> You know, uh, we're glad you're here and uh, uh, say a word uh, about some of the uh, younger guys that are there. And, and uh, that still seems weird for me to say that. OK, uh, Brother Gunther back here, Brother Carter's son back here, Brother Shutt here, our assistants and a number of you other young men. You are an encouragement to me uh, because, uh, you know, I believe the Lord's coming and I anticipate his return any day. Uh, I'm praying that he comes July the 7th. I told three or four people that this morning. That's what my prayer is. And you say, why? Because I want to see Harold Camping get smacked beside the head at least 5,000 times going, you moron. You said it was April. You moron. May. May the 20th. You idiot. You know. And then have the Lord come back July the 7th and when he stands before the Lord going, you idiot. May. What were you thinking? You know. Uh, it's that's my sadistic nature, I guess. Um, I remember uh, those days when I was just a young preacher. And I believed then the Lord was coming. And my faith has not changed. I still believe with the same fervency the Lord's coming and anticipate His return quickly. But uh, I appreciate not just only these guys who are here. And uh, I appreciate Dr. Carter probably more than I could ever convey to him. And to Brother Stauffer, Brother Grady, these men that have done so much. Brother Gipp, that have done such a tremendous uh, amount of work for the benefit of the body of Christ that have helped in this issue. Um, I appreciate uh, Dr. Ripplinger. I wish she could have been with us. And uh, I am not timid and shy. I'm not afraid to be classified as a Ruckmanite. doesn't bother me at all. Uh, Dr. Ruckman uh, taught me my Bible, and Dr. Ruckman was a father in the ministry, and uh, Dr. Ruckman has been one of my closest friends for a long time. And I have never in my life heard more lies told about any one individual that I know personally. Uh, okay, you want to you want to bash him, help yourself, but. Uh, uh, be careful about parroting what you heard or what you read or what you think or what you, uh, you know, we're liable to take a dozen things you've set out of context and put together a nice little tape and go that route. But I said all that to say this, I believe the Lord's coming, but I'm confident that if He doesn't, God has, uh, 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 He's raised up some troops to fight the fight. And uh, that's encouraging to me because I know that uh, this is not something that will just die over time, I have every confidence that uh, 30 years, 50 years from now, if the Lord hasn't come back, in whatever despicable state the world is in, there will still be some young men standing preaching the truths that we know and preach today. And I think that's got to be an encouragement to the heart of the Lord, that He knows there will always be some of those Philadelphia-type believers that will struggle and do what needs to be done. But Steve, come do for us this morning what God's given you. Morning. That was a little dead. Try it again. Good morning. Good morning. That's better. All right. Oh, it's already on. Never mind. All right. The book of Ephesians. Chapter number five. I'm going to go a different route this morning than what I normally do. If, uh, I don't know that everybody was in there, but uh, a lot of the people that were in the college and career class Sunday morning kind of know where I'm going with this passage. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse number 20. <clears throat> Giving thanks always for all things unto whom? A little weak. Try it again. Unto who? God. And the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And all the men said... Better not go there. <laughs> For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, 
Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And all the women said. (laughs) Not getting any help this morning. Now, the next two verses are what I want you to pay attention to. A lot of people, they they read these passages and they, you know, they start browbeating the married people, which is fine. Okay, we need it on occasion. Um, By the way, when it talks about husbands, love your wives, it's an unconditional love. Ladies, I hate to break it to you. There are days you just ain't lovable. Guys, same for you. I heard a man, in, uh, a young man my age, stand up and tell his youth department, he said, Christ came into the world because we were worth his dying. No, 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 no. Christ died because we were not worth it. He died to make us worth it. Now, on the version issue, you, you other speakers, people that I look up to, I want you to catch something. This is just from my heart, really quick, okay? Folks, when you stand and defend the Bible, you are standing near the bullseye that the devil wants to destroy with the biggest guns he can possibly find. These men, myself included, have taken hits that, and believe it or not, they're from the brethren. Okay? They're from people who claim to be fellow King James believers. However, when you pigeonhole them and start asking them questions, they're usually TR men. And you cannot, let me just state this really quick. I know I'm not going to get in trouble for this. You cannot be TR only and King James only at the same time. Just, it's you know, oxymoron there. Anyway, but catch the next two verses, 26 and 27. That he might sanctify and cleanse it, referring to the church, with the washing of water by the word. Next verse. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Here's my question. You guys, you speakers, you all are my heroes. You all have no idea how honored I am to be asked by Pastor Sal, who is a hero of mine. Uh, On my radio broadcast, I air him constantly. His sermons constantly go out because he is a blessing to me, along with every one of these other men. But you know why we stand and defend the Bible? Because it's worth it. And because of this one verse, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. My question is this. How in this world are we to be clean if the water is dirty? That's a fair question. Now, everybody today, everybody in the whole argument wants to talk about inspiration. Wonderful. Don't misapply it. Use Scripture to define your terms. For the gift has helped me probably more than anything. And the argument that he said, the question to ask, has helped me win more arguments than anything when it comes to the version issue. Do you accept the Bible as your final authority in all matters of faith and practice? Don't just stop at faith. Practice is included in that. And guess what? The inspiration issue is included in that. Because... I, had a, I heard a gentleman with my own two ears make this statement. He said, y'all know that God doesn't speak English? I have never heard a more stupid argument. How many of you have ever witnessed to somebody in English? If that statement's true, you need to go back and tell them that you lied. And then you need to witness to them in either Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic. How many of you could pull that one off? Um, never mind. Nobody. You know why? We don't speak it. You say, oh, Stephen, I don't like where you're going with this. (laughs) I don't care. Um, I will say this, honestly. You can differ with me on the version issue all you want. That's perfectly fine. It's a free country. You have the freedom to be wrong. 
But don't come to me telling me my belief is wrong until you can support yours with Scripture. Every one of the men that you've heard speak has given Scripture to support their belief. I sent an email to a prominent TR defender. I said, can you give me one Bible verse to support your TR only ism? You know the verse he sent me? In English, mind you. 2 Timothy 3.16. I sent it back to him. I said, this is in English. It doesn't count. But you know what? Inspiration. In, in Bible college, they taught me that inspiration was excruciatingly difficult to understand. And you needed three years to truly understand it. Okay. Of course, none of which included Scripture. But nonetheless, keep in mind, folks, inspiration is simple enough for a child. Because... Timothy was taught from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. If a child can't get it, it's too difficult. Thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Folks, there is the issue today. You want to know why there's a fight? Because we got too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Everybody wants to dictate what the Bible should say instead of letting the Bible be the chief for all of us. That's the problem. Now, the Holy Bible liveth, that's inspiration, and abideth, that's preservation, forever. Please note, it does not say it liveth, then died. They both abide forever. You cannot have one without the other. So again, help me out with that one. Listen, if you ever get to the place where you've learned too much, you've learned nothing. I have nothing wrong with edu- there's nothing wrong with education, but when education exceeds common sense, you're still an idiot. Much like your income, your finances. When your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall every time. Inspiration abides, and the life is preserved. Now, Psalm 12, 6 and 7 say, the words of the Lord are pure words. Now, I want you to catch this next part. Thou shalt keep them. Who's doing the keeping? The Lord. Now, here's my question. If he's going to be doing this forever... Who's the only person that could do that? The Lord. Last time I checked, he's not going to die anytime soon. He would be the one to make sure that it got right all across the board. Now, I recently watched the debate that Dr. Gipp had with, against the modern version guys. The guy actually said this was referring to people. Now, here's my question. I had a 20-year-old tell me that statement two days ago. It was amazing. Because I had personally never heard that argument. So, in spirit of kindness, I asked him, I said, do you take that verse, that passage, literally? He said, yes, absolutely. I said, keep that in mind. If it's referring to people, where are these 3,000-year-old people? That's taking the verse literally. Thou shalt preserve them if it's peoples. They've got to be around somewhere. And I would like to meet them. But since it's referring to words, I've already met them. And guess what? They met me as a 15-year-old boy and showed me my need of a Savior. A dead book won't do that. That's another debate. Anyway, a mummy, not a mommy, guys. A mummy is preserved, but it's not alive. Ramsey I is in Cairo Museum. He's preserved. He'd make good firewood one day. But he's not alive. My Bible is totally different. Because God is still speaking. And God is still alive. Therefore, since his word is alive and it belongs to him, he speaks to me through it. Now, both the King James Bible and inspiration can be proved as perfect. The King James Bible is 100% perfect. There is zero error in it. If you think, if you have sat in this conference and you still think that there's an error in the King James Bible, you are beyond help. 
you, step, you have stepped through the doors and gone both blind, deaf, and dumb. And whichever way you want to take the definition of the latter word. Folks, there, is ze- there are no errors in the King James Bible. But the only way for that to be true is for it to be given by inspiration. It's the only way it's going to happen. Because preservation involves both God and man. Inspiration is totally of God. Boy, it got quiet on that one. Now, here's interesting. Here's an interesting thing. The word sin occurs 447 times in the King James Bible. The word blood also occurs 447 times in the King James Bible. It's interesting. There's just enough blood to cover every one of my sins. Now, I don't find that a, uh, what was the word you used? ding. I don't find that a coincidence. God's got to be involved. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, fine. Because all of the new versions, following Greek and Hebrew lexicons, sometimes even go so far as to change blood to death. Destroying the perfection. Because, folks, blood is life. It ain't death. George Washington can prove that. When George Washington was being bled to death by the barber, which is still true today in some cases, the verse right beside of him said the life of the flesh is in the blood. If they had read that, he could still be alive today. (laughs) Probably not, but anyway. Now, the King James Bible's built-in dictionary uses matching words in parallel verses to identify the parallels that define the unfamiliar words. Okay, let me give you one word for this. Context. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. The golden rule of interpretation. Now, a lot of people say, Brother Shut, don't you know that there are antiquated words in your Bible? Yeah. No. Didn't catch that one. Here's why. Because God, since he wrote it, he can define it however he wants. In linguistics, there's a thing called a peg. What that does is it hinges everything else. It defines the word for you. Cumbrance is a word that a lot of people ask about. They say, Brother Shut, you don't even know what a cumbrance is. No, nope, my Bible tells me because the Bible says, How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? If you look up the word cumbrance in the dictionary, it has two definitions. Burden and strife. Can we get ink? Think not. Now, everybody asks, how many of the speakers have heard the word a shoe? People always want to make fun of that word. Sounds like somebody's sneezing. Okay. They say, we don't know what that word means. Okay. Well, let him and evil become the pegs in these verses in 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10, because it says, let him refrain his tongue from evil. Let him eschew evil. The word eschew, when you look it up, means to refrain your tongue. Keep your mouth shut. It's better to make people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Okay. Well, can I get a thing of water, too? I'm... <laughs> yeah. Smile! No. Anyway, I'm not supposed to do that. Sorry. Now, a lot of people say, why does the King James Bible avoid street language? Well, it's pretty simple, because the Word of God, little w, must be like Jesus the word, as described in Hebrews 7.26, as holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher. I thank the Lord that Christ is separate from sinners, because my eternal destiny hinges on that. Praise the Lord. Thank you. It's just a drinking problem. Nothing major. It's a joke. You can laugh. It'll be all right. <clears throat> now, the 1568 Bishop's Bible sounds modern, okay? Yes, Lord, for you closed, lusted places, took me not, dear. Now, I have dear and beloved. The King James sounds archaic when you look in comparison, okay? These two words right here are really where people get hung up. They say, see, see, it says beloved. Uh, yeah, think about word association. The Edinburgh Associative Thesaurus Word Association Response. You can look that up on the Internet. You can type in any words you want. 
And it will, they walked up to people at random and said, I'm going to give you a word. Tell me the first thing you think. Okay? They did that with the word dear, as it is in the Bishop's Bible and every single modern version today. The response, sir, madam, girl, enemy, foe, animal, dog, hamster, and inmate. My guess is they were talking to a congressman. But anyway, can't do that from behind the pulpit, so I'll step over here. Um, folks, folks, honestly, that's too stupid to make up. Okay. When they said the word beloved, the response was this. Wife, darling, love, child, God, heart, cared, Christ, church, family. Anybody see a little bit of a difference? Now, why would that be the case? Because it's a holy Bible. It's not just something that somebody can pick up off a shelf. It's God's holy word. Now, the King James Bible is not archaic. People say, oh, we don't understand the word hope and we need to go to help. Well, think about it. The word help is from A.D. 800. Now, those of you who don't know when that is, that was a long time ago. The word hopen was introduced hundreds of years later, but it was introduced strictly as a Bible word. Now, here's my question. If we want to stop being archaic, why do you want to go to help? When Holpen was introduced years later, it's a much younger word, and it's a biblical word. Probably because they don't want to be biblical, historical, or spiritual about the matter. But that's just me. When the cat jumped from the curtain seal, the curtain was torn in two. That's what the NIV says. Although it doesn't say the cat jumped from the window sill, but, you know. It might as well. However, yeah, some of you all are getting that little slow this morning. When the God of all glory died for our sins on the cross, the veil was rent in twain. Special moment, special language. Totally different. You can, you know, tear a curtain in two any time. I do that hanging up curtains. I hate the curtain thing. But you know what? I know a difference when I hear the veil was rent in twain. I know what that was about. That was because of me. That was because of you. Special moment, special language. The modern versions completely destroy that. Some state that language is constantly changing and it's changing rapidly, so we need to learn Greek and Hebrew because at some point, we, we smart peoples, We'll need to update the language of the Holy Bible to match how men talk. Here's the problem. The Bible is not men talking. It is God talking to men. can't be updated because it ain't you talking. You can change my... Well, you can't change my words anytime you want, but you could if you wanted to. <laughs> Whatever happens in life stays on YouTube. And I'm sure some of this stuff will be on YouTube. Your loving our lives will be on YouTube by the, end, by, the week, by the week's end, I promise you. You know, when God says, this is my word, I change not. Think about that. If it's his word, he's the only one that can tamper with it if he wants. Much like this world, it's his. He can wreck it if he wants. It's his word. He can change it if he wants. And guess what? He has not. Now, everybody wants to argue over... 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's a good verse to talk about. But everybody puts a period at the end of God and stops the chapter. Don't do that. Keep the verse in context. A grammatically parallel structure would be all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The parallel to that would be all pure water is produced by distillation of Jones Bottled Water Company. In English, that is a perfectly parallel structured sentence. The water is called distilled water. Just like the Bible is called inspired scripture. Scripture that is given by inspiration of God. The same effect. Now, let's look at the Holy Bible's definition of given by inspiration of God. Folks, listen. When you start wanting to define words, do me a favor. Keep it biblical stay within the bounds of context the definition of inspiration is plain to him that understandeth lest our minds should be corrupted 
from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, someone who's in their Bible doesn't have a hard time understanding that when it says what it says, that's what it means to say. When I heard that the definition of inspiration was complicated, believe it or not, I had just read that morning in my devotions that passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I knew at that point that something's wrong. Because anything that's supposed to be related to Christ should be kept simple like he is. It's got to be on a level playing field for dummies like me. Folks, listen, you say, I don't have time to understand the King James issue. If I can understand it as a dumb 23-year-old, what's your excuse? Listen, that ought to tell you something about these guys' books. Because if I can read it and understand it, you have no excuse. Okay, I'm a couple pickles short of a Happy Meal. Now, a compound word is made up of two other English words. For example, a bricklayer is one who lays bricks. The definition is built in. It's called cognitive scaffolding, where the definition of the actual word is built into the word itself. Inspiration is a compound word. Inspiration is made up of the preposition in, the noun, S-P-I-R, from spirit. That's gonna, I want you to keep this in your noodle, folks, because we're going to come back to that. The Bible reader has seen the words in and the phonemes, S-P-I-R, in the word spirit hundreds of and hundreds of times, long before he ever gets to the word inspiration. Okay? Everybody still with me? Good. Now, the use of the word S-P-I-R, meaning spirit, lines up perfectly with John 6.63, where Jesus defines his own words. Listen, you want to know who the best person to define their words is? The author. If I have a question with my mother-in-law's book, Dr. Ripplinger's book, I don't go to Dr. Gill. I don't go to Pastor Sal. I go to the author. Same with them. If I have a question with their book, I call them. Say, boss, I'm clueless. And the response is, yeah, I know what you need. (laughs) Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are, present tense, spirit. And they are Present tense, life. Now, the ending A-T-I-O-N on inspiration changes a verb, an action like inspired, to a noun. A thing such as inspiration. Inspires the verb. Inspiration is the biblical noun. Remember this, because the NIV and every single modern version that I have seen changes it to an adjective, inspired. Now, why would they do that? Because inspired past tense. It's a one-time thing. When someone accuses you of double inspiration, this is the most fun I have ever had with somebody. You say, you believe in double inspiration. How so? Well, you believe the King James is inspired. Question number one. How many authors of Scripture were there? Anybody want to take a stab? Forty. Did they all exist at the same time? No, over a period of about 1,500 years. I always ask at that point, do you believe that? That they all existed at one time and they were all written by one person? Well, no, of course not. Written by 40 authors over 1,500 years. You're going to have a problem with me having two? And you've got at least 40? Over 1,500 years? A little hypocritical to me. Here's the reason why they don't want to call the King James Bible given by inspiration. Because it shows them their fault. The modern versions don't. Therefore, inspiration is the action of the Spirit in, for the grading, the giving of the Scriptures. That was an amazing message the other night, bro. Thank you. All Scripture is given by the Spirit acting in the giving of the Scriptures. The first and only other usage, and you, you heard all of this, I'm just repeating a lot of it, okay? How many of you brought a notepad or something to write on? You're about to have a lot to write. Okay. Like many other usages, Job 32.8 defines the word for you because it says, but there's a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Now, it's pretty simple. The Spirit of God dwelling in the King James Bible translators gave them understanding. That one statement 
will get you thrown out of the majority of Bible colleges today. Just heads up. Okay. Let's look at some parallels here. Inspiration, the Greek noun, theonoustos. People say, well, you know, well, we'll get to that here in just a second. Almighty, the, he, the inspiration, the Hebrew noun, neshama. Almighty, God, giveth, given, understanding, instruction, them, and man. Perfectly parallel. 100%. In summary, the Bible itself defines inspiration. The three parts of inspiration build its meaning. Folks, listen. When someone says that you have to go to the Greek to understand inspiration, here's my question that you need to ask. Why must I go to a language that I neither read, write, or understand fully to define a language that I both read, write, and understand and understand better than most of the other languages? That doesn't make sense. That would be like me trying to give a dissertation on nuclear physics. It just ain't going to happen. Now, I want you to note something. We didn't need a separate dictionary to define any of that. Didn't have to have it. Because most of the world today will never see a dictionary. Probably because it hasn't been written yet. But no, nonetheless. They may not have a dictionary. But they'll have a holy Bible. Boy, it got awfully quiet in here. Folks, listen, I'm not against dictionaries. I'm not against learning. What I am against is when you start imposing Scripture upon what you think. Got a problem with that. If the Bible says one thing and you think another, sorry, you're wrong. Now, one has got to remember that secular dictionary definitions are based upon context. Let's just look at one example. Depending on the context of the word, to cum- save can mean to accumulate money, to copy computer data to a storage medium, to preserve a victory by a relief pitcher, or in the case of the Carolina Panthers, a whole relief team, or to deliver from sin. All four are valid definitions. Every one of them. How do I know which one to use? Because secular dictionaries, they have to include the Bible, the Bible usage along with the secular usage of the word. Folks, listen. When you start using a secular definition to define a theological or biblical word, you will always be wrong. Always, across the board. You know why? Because the Bible has a specific meaning. I can't say, he saved you from sin. He put you in a computer data. He, or put you in a bank that the government would own. But anyway, folks, listen. Context determines everything. You have to keep in mind, secular dif- dictionaries take their meanings from everywhere. They have to. So why not just get yours from the source? If a dictionary, this is the fun part. When people start saying, well, you have to go to the Greek. Okay, well, number one, my Bible is in English. Okay. Now, I'm not against Greek. Please don't misunderstand me. It's a beautiful language, but it's dead. Believe it or not, the Hebrew that you are taught if you were to go over to Israel and try to speak that, it ain't going to work. And I know that because I had a Jewish man tell me that, who is from Israel. And again, I think he would know. Anyway, if God defined a word for himself, if he defines it, let him define it. Hey, do the trouble. Webster's 1828, and Brother Grady mentioned this, and again, I'm just hitting a lot of the stuff that's already been hit. Just bear with me, okay? Webster's 1828 says of inspiration, the infusion of ideas into the mind by the Holy Spirit. And then, ironically, he gives a scripture reference for it. Now, why would he do that? Because how are you going to know who the Holy Spirit is outside of scripture? Much like witnessing. How are you going to lead somebody to Christ outside of scripture? Your testimony may be wonderful, but scripture's got to play a part in there somewhere. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of Brother Stauffer. That's what the scoffer version says. Anyway, no, it says hearing by the word of God, not man. Now, I, I want to preface my, my next little passage right here. Everybody today is coming in using of inspiration the term God breathed. Okay? Not against that. 
so long as you understand what the breath of God entails. Because when you look it up with Scripture, the breath of God is always linked with the Holy Spirit. Always. It's always linked with the Spirit throughout Scripture, Old and New Testaments. Always. The problem today is people are wanting to take the Holy Spirit completely out of it. Because 95% of them are not Trinitarians. They don't believe in the deity of Christ. So, why not just use God breathe? It's a one-time thing. It's not. See, the NIV and ESV say God breathed or breathed out by God instead of given by inspiration. Now, I want you to catch what the ESV says. Breathed out by God. That is not inspiration. That is expiration. Which is exactly what they want to do to your Bible. They want to make it expire. Because if it's expired, that means they can do another copyright and get more money off of it. Which, mind you, be careful where you get your King James Bible from as well. Because since the only copyright that's on it is a crown patent, which is not enforced, it probably will be now since I just said so, they can do whatever they want with it. And guess what? They do. There are places where three and four words in a verse are gone. Now, they can't say New King James, but they can just say Revised Old King James, which is exactly what they do. You know why they would do that? Because they don't believe the Holy Spirit's involved in it. You see, when you start removing the Holy Spirit from God and His Word, it's easy to do anything you want, because there's zero conviction at that point. Even the Greek word underlying is given by inspiration, which is theot mustos, is translated 322 times as spirit. Not one time is it translated as breath. Say, I don't like that. I don't care. It's a fact. If, how many of you in here went to Bible college? When you studied pneumatology, what did you study? The Holy Spirit. How come when it comes to inspiration, theot mustos, with the underlying word being pneuma, it becomes breath. Folks, be consistent. If you're not going to be consistent, please don't claim King James only believers because we will head slap you. Okay? Inspiration, and consequently the Holy Spirit, is gone from the NIV. Again, they don't believe in the Trinity. A lot of people link these two verses together, and they should be linked. All right? The Holy Spirit's involved in both of them, however. Unless, of course, you have an NIV. Which, by the way, um, there are two perversions missing. If you have them and you're reading from them, problem. Uh, but you do need to return them. Brother Stoffer wants to do his daily devotional today. <laughs> Moved by the Holy Ghost and given by inspiration of God. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God, by the way. You see, in 2 Timothy 3.16 you can perfectly see the Trinity in the King James Bible. Because Scripture, Jesus, the Word, inspiration is of the Holy Ghost, it's of the Holy Spirit, and God is the Father. Perfectly seen in there. If you allow the Bible to interpret itself. Now, not all of the Bible was given by God speaking out loud to begin with, as it was to Jeremiah or John in the Revelation, where God said, write in a book. Paul said, I think also that I have the Spirit of God in 1 Corinthians 7.40 in regards to widows. Much seems to have been given by the Spirit, as Wycliffe said, in the heart. Wycliffe said, quote, he himself had dictated it within the hearts of the humble scribes, stirring them to follow that form of writing and description which he had chosen. And not because it was their own word, but God hath revealed it, had revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. He continued in the 1300s. I covered this Monday. He said, you say it's heresy to speak of the Holy Scriptures in English. You call me an heretic because I've translated the Bible into the common tongue of the people. Do you know whom you blaspheme? Did not the Holy Ghost give the word of God at first in the mother tongue of the nations to whom it was addressed? Why do you speak against the Holy Ghost? 
Now, keep in mind, and I'm going to make a little plug here. Back in the back, there's a book called Hazardous Materials by Dr. Ripplinger. You need to get that book. How many of you have that book and or have read it? Okay. I will tell you this as a heads up. There are chapters that when you read them, you'll feel like you'll need to go take a shower. Because it's pretty intense. When you start seeing what the men who worked on the modern versions and lexicons believed, let me ask you something. Would you have a pedophile behind your pulpit, preachers? Would you have them working with your children? Why would you want to use one of their lexicons? Would you want to use a le- would you have a man preach in your pulpit? <laughs> Gentlemen, have to clarify that now. Who believed that Jesus Christ was the illegitimate child of a Roman soldier? No. If I were to say that, you'd take me outside, stone me to death, and then burn what was left of me on a stake. Rightfully so. But if you won't let me get away with that, which, by the way, I don't believe. <laughs> Got to clarify that, too. Why would you use a book by somebody who does? To define a book that was written by God himself, who obviously didn't believe it. Which, by the way, uh, you're talking about Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins. You know what? God doesn't believe in atheists. That's true. God really doesn't. To the same extent, why would you want to define God's word with a lost man? Just a thought. Wycliffe said, The clergy cry aloud that it's heresy to speak of the Holy Scriptures in English. And so they would condemn the Holy Ghost who gave tongues to the apostles of Christ to speak the word of God in all languages under heaven. They say, Well, Stephen, you know it was only written in Greek. Really? Got proof? I'd love to see it. We're going to cover that here in just a second, but I want you to keep in mind. In Acts chapter 2, it completely destroys the Greek only mentality. You TR guys, when you can conquer Acts chapter 2 and 2 Timothy chapter 3, come back and talk to me. Because with the TR mentality, you cannot. Wycliffe said, such a charge is to condemn the Holy Ghost who first gave the scriptures in tongues to the apostles of Christ that were to speak the word in all languages that were under heaven. Coverdale continued by saying, no, the Holy Ghost is as much the author of it in Hebrew, Greek, French, Dutch, and English as in Latin. Let me pause right here. The Catholic Church has always wanted to have a monopoly on the Latin. And the original, you want to know who started the original only mentality in the clergy? And I hate that term, but nonetheless, the Roman Catholic Church. So when you say, well, the originals are the only thing, guess who you line up with? I don't like that. But guess what? This argument is not, old. It's not something brand new. It's old. Because the devil doesn't have any new tricks. He just puts a new twist on it. The Roman Catholic Church said, oh, it's got to come from Latin. Most Baptists today say it's going to come from the Greek. Same stupid argument with no biblical background, just a different parrot. One was yellow, one was blue. They're both dead, okay? The Scripture leaveth no poor man unhelped. And why? Because it is given by the inspiration of God. There was a gentleman, I'll not call his name, who said that in all of the old Bibles that you read, they all said, breathed out by God. God breathed, breathed out. God, God breathed, breathed by God, breathed out. Well, <clears throat> Dr. Ripplinger and I just thought something didn't sound right. So we checked the Bibles that we have from that time period. Because, you know, I don't think he was a liar. I just don't think he was telling the truth. Thank you, brother. And none of the old Bibles say breathed by God. They say given by inspiration. Why? Because they knew the Holy Spirit was involved. You know why? Because they had experienced him. You want to know why most of the modern versions want to remove the Holy Spirit? They've never met him. You won't want to take away one of your friends. How many of you guys would want somebody just to come up and just take away your wife for any reason? One hand. (laughs) There went that example. Nobody. Why would you want someone to take away your Savior and the one that convicts you of your sin? Got a problem with that, folks. 
breath is tangible and requires, it implies a tangible miracle with God speaking out loud rather than the normal leading of the Spirit of God in the heart of, catch the next word, the believing translator. Ah, there's your problem with 95% of the other modern versions today. Hate to break it to you. Virginia Mollencott is not a believing person. Okay. Better not call the next name. Anyway, most of the people who promote these other versions, you start asking them about their salvation, there's no personal acceptance of of Christ as Savior. None. I've talked to four promoters of it, and none have a personal testimony. They're all Calvinists. They say, well, I was elect before the foundation of the world. I don't have to accept Christ. Now, believe it or not, in their Bible... That would be right. You know why? Holy Spirit's gone. No conviction. I might as well be preaching from Shakespeare. With the Bible that's given by inspiration of God, there's no allowance then for new versions or lexical definitions to improve upon the Bible as it is the words of the Spirit of God, not just those that can, uh, not just those of a translator that can be approved on at any time, which can be. Which is why I say this King James Bible cannot be improved. It can't be because it's not the words of the King James translators. Do you honestly think that 54 men could get together and come to a conclusion on anything? You all know what a camel is, don't you? It's a horse that a Baptist committee tried to put together. When the words given by inspiration of God are retained instead of the NIV reading God breathed, then all Scripture can be given by the Spirit of God. A miraculous audible voice isn't necessary. Just the normal leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Bible is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Keep in mind, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God. If inspiration does not count to your English Bible, let me tell you something. You're fighting a losing battle because your sword's a piece of plastic. They want to take away your sword and replace it with one of them little Hawaiian sword toothpicks. That's what they want to do. Because they want to take away your faith and put it on them. I'll not replace one pope of one flavor for another of just a different flavor. I'll let no man stand over and lord power over me if it's not given by the Holy Spirit. When a man stands up and says, well, a better translation for that would be, I always ask, says who? Man or God? Here's a question. Did God or man tell you that your King James Bible is not given by inspiration? Just a thought. Jesus said, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Unless the Bible is given by inspiration of God, it has no life and they can and then can't help anybody. Because it's just the product of some man. You're hopeless. Those who say that their Bible is alive, but not inspired, either do not know or do not believe what Jesus said in John John 6, 63. Now, I'm not saying they don't believe it. What I'm saying is that is an option. Because 95% of the people you talk to are going to say that they believe every word until you start questioning them. Is that not right, brother? You know why? When the Holy Spirit's taken out of your Bible, there's no conviction. You can do whatever you want with it. This is not your word. Leave it alone. Let's look at the words all Scripture. Does all mean the originals from Genesis to Revelation? Or does all include copies and vernacular editions as well? That's the question you've got to answer. When you go off to Bible college... Here's what they want to do. They want to make all mean only the originals. In 95% of your Bible colleges today, that's what they want to do. You know why? Because then they ensure there's a line between the clergy and the laity. You're better than them. I was actually told in Bible college, in the theology class, gentlemen, there are going to be things that you're going to learn in this Bible class that you can never let your people know you believe I heard that and nearly had a heart attack. Of course, me and my big mouth. 
He said, what, Mr. Shot? I said, if I'm supposed to believe it, but the people in the pew don't, how am I supposed to make them believe it without blowing my cover? He looked at me. He said, I'll get back with you on that. (laughs) Cop out. God placed the sole verse on inspiration of Scripture in a context identifying inspired Scripture as what a grandmother and mother has taught a child. Now, if Timothy's grandmother was much like my grandmother, it's got to be simple. And if Timothy was anything like me, it's really got to be simple. God had to really filter it down through grandma just to make sure that I could get it. From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, not thoroughly. If your Bible says thoroughly, it's wrong. Truly furnished unto all good works. Now, here's my question. If your King James Bible is not given by inspiration, verses 16 and 17 cannot count for you. The context includes scripture that is accessible to a child, accessible for doctrine, for proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that a child can understand. But then scriptures for good works. Scriptures are for everybody, folks, not just the scholars. It's not just for the people who are educated. Educated, excuse me. I'm from Virginia. Folks, it's for everybody. Remember what James said. All that is necessary for salvation is, in, is found within the pages of Scripture. To set them, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. In 1903, even Apostate Phillips, who about mispronounced that last name, Philip Schaff, forgive me, Lord, wrote in his critique of the King James Bible, to the great mass of English readers, the King James Version is virtually the inspired word of God. Even a lost man got it. But you know what he did? He sought to change it. Now, keep in mind, folks, the definitions in the back of Strong's Concordance, the Greek and Hebrew, they don't match your King James. Here's why. Strong was on this man's committee, the ASB committee. This man actually said that no man could be on his committee who believed that the originals were given by inspiration of God. You couldn't be on his committee and believe that. Now, I'm not saying that Strong didn't believe that. What I'm saying is he was on the committee and that was the rule. That's all I'm saying. So when you start trying to define words with someone who doesn't even believe that they were given by inspiration to start with, odds are you're not going to wind up in the same place. You'll never end up in the right destination by starting on the wrong road. It won't happen. Christians have gotten the impression that the Bible is inspired, they got it from their Bibles. Again, I made this statement the other day. I've never met a person who all they did was read their Bible who questions its inspiration. Never. I've never met one. Now, if you're here and you believe that and that's all you've read, I don't want to hear from you because that messes up my analogy. Now, catch this, folks. This is, we're celebrating the 400-year anniversary of the King James Bible. That is a feat in and of itself. But I want you to think about this. Over 400 years, the entire body of Christ has gotten behind this book. I don't think over 400 years we could have all gotten it wrong. The odds of that are like 258 million to the tenth power. It's off the charts. It's not going to happen. However, your critics are in the minority because they didn't believe it to begin with. The word of the Lord liveth, excuse me, abideth, endureth, I'll get it out in a minute. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Folks, how are you going to get the gospel unless it's given by God? When you read men's textbooks and lexicons, you will always question its inspiration. I'm I'm working on a book right now going through theology books. I call um, all the colleges that I don't recommend just to see if there was a a, uh, commonality in theology books. Most of the theology books that are in Bible colleges today 
were written by Calvinists. That tells me their theology is off just a touch. Just a touch. Okay? They also teach the originals only theory, which I do call a theory. I do not believe in the King James inspiration theory. Don't hold to that. I hold to the Acts 2 principle. Big difference between the two. But you hold to the originals only theory, there's no scripture to support it. But every one of the theology textbooks promotes it. And they all say it's recognized by scholars. Well, there's a red flag. Most of your scholars aren't saved. So why trust them? Every usage of the word scriptures in your King James Bible refers to copies or translations. It never refers to the originals. It never refers to solely the originals. You say, I don't believe that. Here are a couple of verses to choke down. Matthew 21, 42. Jesus asked, did you never read in the scriptures? Here's my question. Did the men that Jesus was talking to have the originals? No. Mark 12, 10. Jesus said, have you not read this, this scripture? Did this person have the originals? No. Luke 24, 45. Who can tell me what was going on at this point in Luke 24? Road to Emmaus. Okay. Jesus met them on the way. These people were so depressed. Jesus said, what? What's the matter with you? This is the shut version. Okay, just bear with me. He said, what's the matter with you guys? Why are you so upset? Why, why, why is your countenance falling? He said, have you not heard? And then they gave the spell about how Jesus was butchered and thrown upon a cross and then buried. And now it's three days and we'll never see him again. Then Luke 24, 45 comes in. Opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Did Jesus have the Torah with him? And he said, hold on a minute, gentlemen, let me pull out the scriptures. Well, that would be really bad if you had a new scroll, wouldn't it? Well, how would you like to walk around with a scroll tied to your back? Chaffing your back as you're walking. You know? If you get a new scroll and you try to open it, just... <laughs> Jesus said they had the scriptures. Yeah, somebody got that by slope, right? Anyway... Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. If they had the originals only, well, okay, it would make sense. But did they have the originals? No. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. Jesus said, you do, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures. Boy, that can be posted above every door in almost every theology class that I've ever seen. Because a professor, any professor that will stand up and say, well, you have to know the original languages to truly understand and glean the nuggets that are found in the Greek. You do err, not knowing Scripture, because you tell me, look at this verse right here. Then you quote it to me in English. If my English is not given by inspiration, stop quoting it. There is a Bible college right now that actually says that the King James Bible is not given by inspiration. It's not perfect. It has an error in it. But if you want a pastorate in the United States, you must preach from the King James Bible. We're sending guys off to the vast majority of Bible colleges to learn how to be professional liars and deceivers. You want a good college? See Dr. Carter. Go plug. Acts 18.28, Apollos was showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. My question, did Apollos have the originals? No. Also keep in mind, he was from Alexandria. Just a little nugget there. <laughs> that was in English. Paul reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Folks, he didn't have the original Old Testament autographs. Didn't exist. Romans 15.4 says that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. If we don't have scripture given by inspiration of God, there is zero hope for you and me. All scripture includes inspiration to all languages. This, and I'm going to very quickly hurry up. I'm, all, I'm over time. Romans 16.26 speaks of scriptures made known to all languages. Remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Vernacular Bibles are scripture and are inspired. Paulus, born of Alexandria, Egypt, was mighty in the scriptures. Samaria had received the word of God in Acts 8.14. Those villages spoke the language of Samaria. They did not speak Greek. 
of the Ethiopian eunuch, it says the place of the scripture which he read. The Cambridge history of the Bible speaks of the Ethiopians who were converted to Judaism after the Queen of Sheba met with Solomon. To this day, they still have their ancient Ethiopic version of the Old and New Testament, not Hebrew. And it's still counted scripture. Some ask, if God originally gave the Holy Bible thousands of years ago, kind of like millions of years ago, in other languages, how can today's English Bible still be, in, still be alive? That was a question that my professor asked me. And if you read that question, it answers itself in the second word. God. He can do what he wants. The answer is, God speaks other tongues. I actually had a man tell me, no, God doesn't. You're beyond help, divine or mine, at that point. Isaiah 28, God promised, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak, saith the Lord. I thank the Lord for that. This was fulfilled in Acts 2. Catch this. Every nation under heaven, every man heard them speak in his own language. You're here in Pentecostal, that doesn't help you any. Okay? They heard him speak in their own language. If God only spoke one language, that wouldn't have happened. Peter could have been given any gift at Pentecost. Any of the disciples could have been given any gift. I, let me tell you something. The gift of flying would have been phenomenal for those guys. Escape persecution? Ha <laughs> you want to kill me? <laughs> off he goes. Fly off like Superman. Okay? It's a bird, it's a plane. No, that's Peter. Anyway. <laughs> Flying was not necessary. God-given scriptures were necessary. If the gift of flying had been given when Peter was killed, that'd been it. The scripture that's given by inspiration of God is continuous. The Levitical priesthood, which preserved the word of God, was to be replaced by the New Testament in the New Testament by the priesthood of all believers, not just the clergy, not just the preachers. I hate. I got to get away from that. Excuse me. God said that he would pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. The outward signs and wonders to Israel were to be replaced by the abiding of the spirit in the individual believer. God would not deal with a nation and one language as he did in Israel. He did do that. But when they rejected him, he said, fine, I'll go to the Gentiles. You don't want me? Fine, I'll go to those who do. Because... Why did, why did the Jews and the Pharisees persecute the Christians so much? Why did they hate the, the apostles? Because they said, whosoever will may come. But there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. To the Jews, that was blasphemy. But God said, no, it's fine just the way I want it. Wycliffe connected tongues and inspiration by saying he sent the Holy Ghost on Pentecost Sunday to inspiration of his disciples. That wasn't me. God knew that the Greeks, as a nation, could not bear the responsibility of preserving the Word of God. Couldn't do it. They say, well, I think they could. Israel couldn't. They say, well, I don't believe that. They disobeyed the Scriptures, and they were the only ones that had them. They couldn't keep them. So God provided the safety net of Acts chapter 2. Not man-made translations, folks. When, when you come in and you say, well, I have to be able to translate this, you can't do anything with Scripture. It's not yours. Every nation would have included scriptures in Latin, Coptic, Gothic, Celtic, Ethiopic, Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac, and many other extant languages. Paul said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. Paul or others who had received the gift of tongues immediately put the gospels and epistles into all the languages of the world. Acts 2 gives no primacy or exclusivity to the Greek language. The sign above the cross was in Latin, Hebrew, and Greek because Greek was not the only language of the time. As a matter of fact, it was only used in the coasts. You say, well, Stephen, you, you do know that the, Roman language, that the Roman world at the time, wherever they were, their legal documents were written in Greek. <laughs> no. All of it was written in Latin. You know why? Because the Caesar had to be able to get a hold of it. Latin was the language of Caesar. Most of the Romans spoke Latin. Paul, in the book of Acts, chapters 21, 22, and 26, refused to speak to the Hebrews in Greek. Now, if Greek was the only language at the time, why would the centurion have looked at Paul and said, Can't thou speak Greek? 
Kind of a stupid question to be asking. James wouldn't have written it, wouldn't have written his epistle in Hebrew because, or in Greek because he was writing to the Hebrews. Even today, Orthodox Jews do not read any language other than Hebrew when they read from Scripture. Do you all have a synagogue up in this area? You do have one? Go there sometime. You have to sit up in the loft, but, you know, listen to them. Their whole sermon is done in Hebrew. Now, why would Paul have broken that? He's trying to reach these people. Why? He's got to reach them somehow. He's got to talk to them in their tongue. Now, you say, David, I don't like that. Don't argue with me. Argue with Herman Hoskier, one of the world-renowned scholar and manuscript, manuscript collector and collator, said this. He said, some of the first originals may not may have been in other languages other than Greek. Now, again, I'm not saying that it was not written in Greek because we do have a Greek New Testament. What I'm saying is you cannot prove and I cannot prove that that was the, <clears throat> that that was the only language that it was written in. He also said multiple language editions were available immediately and were concurrent. They ran parallel with the Greek editions. The word of God grew and multiplied. The word of the, the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as in as it is in all the world. It's, I want to jump. I just want to catch this one right here. Theodoret in AD 200 said this statement. Every country that is under the sun is full of these words, referring to the apostles and prophets, and is turned not only into the language of the Grecians, Greek, but also of the Romans, Latin, Egyptians, Coptic, the Persians and Indians, Armenians, Scythians, Sarmatians, and briefly, into all the languages which any nation useth. Now, I want you to catch the date. A.D. 200. And by that time, these languages already had a Bible. In their language. Now, I know that rocks the boat with the vast majority of Bible colleges. I know that. I can't help that. I'm sorry it messes up your little theory. Get a new one. Here's a thought. Get the Bibles. Okay? It has been an honor to be here. I'm going to stop here because I'm over time. Brother Pastor, thank you all. Thank you for having me in, Brother Pastor. It has, folks, you all have no idea what a privilege this has been for me. Uh, being the young gun in the group, I'm, I'm intimidated by these guys. If I could have half of what they've forgotten, I'd be a genius. Um, but folks, listen. Teenagers, young people, listen to me very carefully. Don't doubt your Bible. Don't let some man take your Bible away from you. God gave it. He kept it. You trust it. That's all he asks of you. Just believe it. It's been an honor to be here, Brother Pastor. Thank you very much. All right. I said yesterday, grab both ears and pull them real hard. And that will stretch. Your, it will hurt, actually, is all it will do. But uh, may give you the capacity to contain a little more. We've got just more to come. And uh, we're going to stand, give you a chance to get out, get back in, and uh, sing a song. And then Brother Carter is going to speak to us.